Hello and welcome to an overview of uh, Night Fighter Ace. This video will cover introduction, setup, and we'll go through one mission, or one sortie, if you will. And um, I had already recorded a, a video, but I did it in vertical format. And I got a lot of feedback to try doing it in horizontal, so that's what I'm going to do. So this game is about the Night Fighter missions uh, over Germany. And uh, it is about a single pilot and crew in a single plane uh, versus a whole fleet. This is a very microscopic view. And this is game is about being, it's about a narrative of one pilot's journey in this war. And so um, they will go on sorties, which start in August of 43, and every row you see here is a potential sortie. And and then he will get results, and if you've played games like uh, Silent Hunters or some of those other games, you might be familiar with this concept of you're going to keep a log of all of your accomplishments, and then uh, as you obtain accomplishments, there are different promotions you can get, and we'll go over those. So um, <coughs> uh, there's when you get your game, you're obviously going to need to punch out your components and sort them in similar kind. I think uh, my, the largest recommendation I would give is that these components with the blue background are mostly used on the mats and um, the uh, the various bases you're going to want to sort them by um, their color and type and and then the uh, these they go with the base so just put them together and uh, and then you're ready to go. Um, the primary focus is your log sheet. Uh, you will spend a lot of time on your specific fighter that you're using. And we'll go over this in a second. Uh, you have the bomber mat here, which um, you will use when you're actually intercepting and engaging a bomber. And then you have your Barbie sheet here where you get to play dress up with your your uh, your pilot and it's Barbies for geeks. I'm reusing a joke from my previous video. I apologize for those of you who've watched both, but uh, anyways, that, that is my description for it. Um, okay, so without uh, wasting too much time, let's just go ahead and get started. You're gonna to go to page five of the rule book. Um, <clears throat> the rules say, there's two ways you can start. The first way is you can just pick your base, which, um, you know, you can pick a Dutch base or you can pick, um, and then from there you get to pick what planes you can use or you can roll a die. And so we're gonna roll, and it's actually, it says a 1d20. The game only comes with a d10, so you gotta just roll it twice. So I rolled a one and a four. So I got a five. Um, it's interesting because with a 1d20, I don't know how to roll two zeros, or a zero, so it would be impossible to ever roll one uh, if you're rolling a 1d10 twice. So um, that's an interesting thing with this game. I don't know if the designer is aware of that, um, but, uh, so you can never get this starting zone by doing the method I just did, but I don't mind. We're gonna start in Floren. So uh, we have to find that now, and that can be a challenge, but it wasn't that much of a challenge. So here is our uh, base. So let's just set that aside. And um, with Floren, we uh, are in this air group, NJG4. So you will find that here. So NJG4. Where are you? Here we go. It's one of these. So it's I slash NJG4. It's the first one. So first NJG4 group. I guess there's a second and a third. So we have two of our pieces. And then the third piece you need to get out of this is you can start with a BF110-4 or a DO215B-5. Okay. 
Um, that's where you take these sheets and you want to sort them. So this uh, gold uh, top is a starter plane. And some of them have a prestige level. Uh, with the mode that I'm playing, you have zero prestige to start the game. Uh, there is a way you can play with these, these ace pilot cards, so you can be thematic and you can play as a particular pilot. And you actually would start with prestige points. And in fact, you even start with a certain number of kills already logged to your credit. And you might even have awards and, you know, Iron Cross second and first class already awarded to you. So this is just a nice thematic way of playing. You will already have some experience, etc. We're not doing that for this particular uh, campaign. So uh, that's an optional thing for you. So a starting plane like this would be not allowed. And then, of course, this is a JU-88, so we can't use a JU-88. So... <clears throat> um, I apologize, I just dropped a piece, so let me grab my piece here. Okay, so that was, yeah. Okay, so we need a BF-110 or a DO. So I have my BF-110 sorted here, and the particular one that we can start with is the F-4. So you can see they're, they're double-sided, and so it's a bit of an exercise just finding the one you're going to start with. Um, this is an F-4A, which is not the right one. There it is, BF-110 F-4. And then, of course, there was a DO-217 that you could also use. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to... Well, let's grab it. So the DO-217... Or, I'm sorry, 215... B-5. So it's the top one here. It's the top one. So these are the two planes we can start with if we use this particular base. This one has a speed of 15. That one has a speed of 17. Um, the thing you need to pay attention to is that there are speed on these bombers. So like for example the Wellington there has a speed of 12 and then you have a speed of 15 for the B-7. So basically it doesn't matter. Uh, both Bombers can catch all the fighters, or, or bombers, both? Blah, blah, blah. Your starting fighters can catch all the bombers, except for the mosquitoes, because the mosquitoes have a speed of 18, and so they can outrun you, but everybody, everything else cannot. And that's fine. I, I don't think there's a starting plane that can catch a mosquito. Um, not unless you uh, start with one of these ace pilots and actually get uh, prestige to start the game. So, uh, but... The, um, the thing to be mindful, though, of is that your speed drops by three if you ever take engine damage. So this one's already at a lower speed to begin with. So you could theoretically miss out on some planes with the DO uh, 215. But another um, point to be made here is the DO starts with uh, antenna. I'm sorry, radar. And it actually has an infrared sensor. And it counts as a radar for purposes of chart B1. We can get into that, but uh, the BF-110, for example, has no radar at all, and so you're actually going to get a penalty on intercepting planes at night. Uh, the radar is sort of important for that. Um, so that's some of the thing, but the DO, uh, you know, you can see here that if you take two hits to the wing, it'll be destroyed, and you'll crash. <clears throat> Whereas I think the BF-110, as you can see, can take three hits. So the BF-110's got a little bit more armor, a little beefier. So that's your uh, trade-off. The last thing to look at is your, your crew. This starts with three crew members, and that one starts with two. Uh, I'm not going to belabor this. This is your personal choice. There's really not a lot um, to, uh, to dwell over. Um, the, this is eight firepower, whereas this one has 18 firepower. So he has the ability to take stuff down a little quicker. Um, and so, um, anyways, that's the uh, th that's uh, the choices. So this particular one packs a punch, but it won't necessarily find planes as easily, and it has less crew. Uh, so, anyways, I'm not going to belabor it. I'm just going to set that one aside. We're going to start with the Do 215. It shows that you have um, infinite ammo here and then eight ammo there, and um, 
So basically you just take your ammo markers, they are double-sided, one and two. So right there we have four, uh, let me find some more. Where did I put my ammo tokens? Right here. So we have eight ammo. We're good to go. Okay, so then you take your, your base and you put it on and your your unit and what am I missing? I'm missing the zone. So it is yeah. It's underneath here. This is the zone. We were in the French zone. So we put that on. Now if you're ever confused, they're all the same color. That's that's all you need to know. This is purely for flavor. It has no impact on the game. And um, it's for just for part of the narrative, and it's very historically accurate. The designer has all kinds of cool notes in the back of the manual. Um, so it's not that important that you find the right one, but it is a nice piece of flavor to add to it. These two, however, are important. And so uh, you just put them here to remind yourself of where you're located. And then the other thing I'll point out real quick is uh, you have to now find your plane. So we have a DO-215 and there's there's a whole bunch of planes here that, you know, you'd have to go through. Um, the yellow highlighted ones are your starter plane, so it does help you to find your starter plane a little quicker. So, for example, this is a DO-215 B-5, which is exactly the one we have. So when you start the game, he's just in your hangar. But I'm going to take this moment right now to explain that when he goes on a sortie, uh, he's going to take off from whatever base you're at. So we're at a French base, so we're going to take off at this French base here. And he's going to go on this row until he lands. And these boxes represent fuel consumption. So technically speaking, he gets this many chances to find a bomber, intercept a bomber, before he has to return and land. Um, as long as we're at this French base, we ignore all the other rows. Um, if we ever move to, like, a, a Berlin base, we would just move down here, and then we would only use this row. Okay, and then the other part to know about this is that what you see in parentheses here is these are where the targets are. So <clears throat> if the Allies, for example, are bombing Munich, um, they would be here. So we would have to expend two fuel units just to intercept those bombers. And then from this point on, we would be doing intercept checks. That's uh, really the primary meat of how sorties work. Um, but anyways, we are in the hangar for now. We've created our plane. We're all set up. We're ready to go. So the next thing we do is we grab our, our book here. And I'm realizing I don't have a pen. So my apologies. I'm gonna go grab a pen. So I don't, I will be back in one second. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> so um, you can just name your pilot and we'll call him BGG. And you know, we're gonna start off on the first sortie here and, and off we go. You can put in your, your plane or whatever information you'd like for flavor and uh, first thing you do is we have to roll for the raid. So there's several charts here that are available to you. And the one you want is this one. And we actually want the other side. So it's called A1, the raid chart. And so it will tell you to roll 2d6. So go ahead, it tells you right here. So we're going to go ahead and roll. So roll to 6. So you go and you find the six, and we're in August of 43, so Frankfurt is the target. So you come to this operations map here, and the target goes on Frankfurt. So I happen to already be there. Okay, and so once you do that, uh, you come to your log, and you write Frankfurt in the log. Okay, and then your plane is going to take off from your base and it's going to go to Frankfurt, which is the second space right there. So we're going to attempt to do an intercept at that spot. But before that happens, a couple of things occur. 
The first one is, is we have to roll for weather. So on your operations map here, there is a weather check. And they have the, the check right on the mat, which is nice. So we're going to roll a d10. And I rolled a 9, which is bad. So bad weather there. And that's going to impact our ability to land at the end of our mission here. So next we do um, the moon. Now that is determined by your mission or your sortie. So the log tells you how the moon wanes and waxes. And so right now we're at dark, minus one. So you will encounter the first error here. Um, they have bright, full, and then bright again. And there's several ways to look at it, but, but there's no dark on here. So they have a misprint. And so um, there is nowhere to put my tar token. So I'm going to just put it here and just know that this is a minus one, not a plus one. And it's written here, so it's not that confusing. But it is an error that you have to be mindful of. And, um, and so the next thing we have to do is an electronics check. Now the electronics check is in another chart called B4 Aircraft Damage Listing. And so it's right here on this table, so it's 2d6. So I rolled a 7, and the 7 says no effect. Um, if I would have, like for example, if I would have gotten a 3, the main radar would have been inoperable. So I would have had to take out my radar and not be able to use it for this particular sortie. It's not damaged, it's just inoperable for... Um, for the rest of the sortie. So there's a difference because damage is something that you would actually have to repair at the end of the sortie, whereas an inoperable uh, electronics failure is not something you have to repair. So um, the last thing you have to do is you have to do what's called a spoof raid. So that's a 2d6 as well. And so I'll explain that after I roll here. So I got a 10, which means I lose one endurance box. So the spoof raid just means that we got fooled and maybe got lost. So we lose an endurance box. So this, this is what's called endurance boxes. And so we move one to the right. Um, remember, every one of these is an opportunity to intercept bombers. And so we got lost and we lost an opportunity here and we spent fuel. So that's the reason why we move one to the right. So that spoof check uh, delayed us, but we still eventually got back caught it back up and now we're going to try to intercept okay so um that's everything you need to get started and now the actual interception sorties or interception of the planes start and when you're going over the sequence of play what we did was we rolled for the raid target and it tells you right here a1 um, we checked for the weather and then we did our electronics failure and then we did our we moved from the takeoff endurance box to the raid location then we checked for spoof raids which delayed us by one so we're now on step five of this process so what i had just showed you was steps one through four and now we're on step five and uh, this is where the meat of the game is and most of the choices and decision making and you'll notice that i actually wrote on the game here on step six that is a known errata. Um, you don't roll for weather a second time. That roll for weather you do up here is the only roll for weather you need to do. So cross this out if you'd like, um, but just understand that, that you need to ignore this uh, when you get to step six. And this is the landing step, so we're not there yet. Um, there's one other error I, I'll mention real quick. Um, it's on the damage chart. Uh, here. So per the designer, this says a times two, but it should be a times one, just like all the other ones are times one. Uh, that times two is a mistake. And this is for table B3. Okay, so before I do the interception check, I realized I skipped a setup step that's going to be important now that we're doing this. And that was, uh, I had to pick if my pilot is going to be an officer or an NCO, a non-commissioned officer. So um, this step is, it's an important step, but it's entirely your choice. 
and whichever way you want to go is your is subjective. Um, but what I will show you is that in the rules, I think it's page 13, bear with me as I flip, uh, it might be 14, yeah, page 15. So right here, page 15 is an explanation of the two different ranks, and um, they each give you different abilities. So, uh, for example, you have a prestige level here, and then as you gain prestige, you're going to go up in prestige level, and that will allow you to get favors from command. And it's basically how well you're recognized by your peers. Um, if you choose to go the officer path, then you will get prestige levels every time you level up. So you will uh, generally have a lot more prestige by being an officer. And if you choose the officer path, you would choose these tokens here. And so you would have... this situation. And so you would start off as the level one officer. I call it level one, but it's a lieutenant. Um, there is no special ability for being a lieutenant. Um, but like I said, you get, um, you get prestige every time you promote. Now, officers start with one experience point. So you would put one there if you're an officer. Now, if you want to be a non-commissioned officer, you would put this here, like so, and uh, that is an Unter Office DR, um, and they actually get a special ability that uh, damage is repaired if you have four to five hits based on a die roll, and then if they go to the next level, uh, that you don't have to roll a die anymore; it's automatic. So they have the ability to 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 repair more damage to their plane, and therefore they won't miss as many sorties. Uh, that's And they get special abilities like that as they promote, whereas the uh, officers don't get those special abilities. But the flip side is, is you don't get prestige as when you promote. Um, the other advantage you get for being a non-commissioned officer is you actually start the game with two experience points. So I'm going to do non-commissioned officer because that's the way I've played so far and I don't want to encounter a rule that I'm not aware of because I haven't been playing as an officer. So this is my, just what I'm most familiar with and uh, the choice is really just yours. Okay, so now, um, like I said, we, we did steps one through four. We're ready to intercept. And so you pull out your interception chart here, which is B1. And I'm going to move it over so there's a little bit less glare. And we roll a 1d10. So I'm going to go ahead and roll. I rolled a 6. Okay, a 6 by itself is no interception. But we do have some modifiers. So minus 1 if there's no working radar. So I have two radar, in fact. Um, well, I have a radar and then I have this thing called an infrared sensor. Counts as a radar, yes. So I have radar, so I don't get a minus one. Uh, I don't have jamming. What does jamming mean? Jamming is on your log sheet. It basically represents allied technology, and that doesn't appear until way down here, which is in January of 44. So you can ignore jamming for a long time, but it'll indicate on your log when jamming starts happening. And then from this point on, there's a jamming of one, uh, for every sortie after that point. Okay, so um, you can ignore jamming for now. Next is your moon phase. And remember, we were in dark, so we have a minus one. So this six became a five. We get plus one if we have radar operation skill. We don't. And then we get plus X per operational radar set. So your radar will actually tell you you get a plus one or something, and that's where you would get to add the plus one. By having a radar with no plus value, that just means I get to ignore the minus one penalty. Um, that's a very important point. I actually misunderstood that and got it wrong in my last video. So thank you to the designer for uh, correcting that for me. And, uh, and then we don't have a FUG 227. So long story short, this became a five and we failed to intercept. So nothing happens. So now we move. One to the right, we roll again. I rolled a three, that was a three. 
Uh, I can tell you nothing's changed here and it's even worse. So we're moving one to the right. Roll to two. Uh, we're moving one to the right. And I rolled a four. Okay, this would be a situation where we would actually be forced to land and I would log into my my uh, log sheet that nothing happened. I encountered nobody. Um, and then I would just move on. I would go to a landing step and and then I could spend experience points and get promoted and all that other stuff, uh, which is the stuff you do after you're sortie, in between sorties. And then I would be off this next sortie to try again. Uh, I'm not going to do that yet. Let's gonna, we're just going to pretend that I intercepted a bomber. Um, because that's, this isn't very fun showing you how I intercepted nobody. Okay, so if you intercepted a bomber, uh, what you do is you grab your first sheet that you had. I'm grabbing it off camera here. The aircraft target chart. So this is just the other side of your raid chart. And remember, we're August of 43, and we have to roll 2d6. So I rolled a 4. So we would intercept a Sterling. So I would take this Sterling that I found in my pile of chits here, and I look up here, and again, apologize, so you can see there's a Sterling, is this middle section. So I would put my Sterling there to indicate I'm doing this bomber here. These bombers have four engines, and that's a two-engine bomber, and then that's a Mosquito over here. So um, these X's mean that the plane is destroyed, and you can see that the B-17 actually has one more uh, box. So if you get to this box here with a B-17, you would actually need one more damage before you can destroy a B-17, and then the Sterling gets destroyed here, whereas the B-17 and a Lancaster have one extra armor there. You see how that works. So um, so this would be what we're going to intercept. Remember, according to the real rules, I found nobody, but I'm just going to go through how this intercept works. And uh, so let me move some stuff out of the way and get this rule book closed up. And let's bring this closer so there's a little bit less glare and let's go ahead and get started so uh, first thing you have to decide is um, so we intercepted the bomber and now we're going to sorry I'm just looking at a chart off the camera here um, we intercepted the bomber so now we're going to decide if we're going to go long range medium range or close and um, so what's the difference? Uh, the way it works is if I come in long range, I'm going to get three attacks on the bomber before I have to break away. And, and if I break away, I can always regroup and attack again. Uh, every time I break away, there's a chance the bomber will escape and you can't find it anymore. So that's one thing to bear in mind. I can choose to come in close range and just get one shot on the bomber and then break away. Um, it's your choice. You don't have to go long range, medium range, and then short. You just don't. Uh, these choices are all yours to make. Um, I think there's some strategies behind uh, each of the different choices. Uh, I won't get into all of that, but um, what's the difference? Long range is you do one less to hit the bomber, and the bomber does one less hit on you. And we're talking random hits here. And I know I haven't discussed what a random hit is versus something else, but that's what a long range does. Medium range is no bonus or penalty. And then a short range is one extra random hit on the bomber, and he does one extra random hit on you. Okay? So that's the difference between the three. Um, I would suggest that the close range might be worth doing... Well, uh, I'll go through both examples. Let's, let's pretend we came in long range, and let's pretend we came in close range and I can explain both how they both play out. So let's say we're coming in long range first. So you make that decision, and then what you do is you just draw two cards from the combat deck. Okay, the first card 
um, you're going to pay attention to the top and ignore the bottom. The second card, you're going to pay attention to the bottom and ignore the top. So we would do this, okay? Now, since this is the first time, I would do the event text. Now let's say I resolve this attack and then this moves up to medium. Because remember I told you, you would keep progressing in your attacks and then break away. So let's say I resolve this attack and then moved here. If I was in this position, after already being here, I ignore the text. That text no longer matters. So this text only applies the very first time you're engaging. Okay, that's the first thing. The second thing that's important is uh, all battles are simultaneous except for the very first time. And this text actually tells you, you're not spotted, you fire first. So uh, it also tells you that the bomber will corkscrew in the remaining rounds. It says next round, but it keeps corkscrewing. So for this first round, we get to fire first, and if we destroy the bomber, he doesn't get to fire back. So there is an advantage, I think, of coming in close range, because you're basically coming in guns a-blazing, and you're, you're, you're banking on the fact that you get to fire first, and you can finish him off before he even gets a chance to fire back at you. That is the strategy here. Um, so if I'm coming in long range, I'm, uh, I still get to fire first, but I actually get one of my hits taken away from me, and uh, the bomber's gonna get the corkscrew. And so what that means is that when I'm at medium range, I still get a minus one penalty to my hits because the bomber's corkscrewing. And then when I go to close range, the corkscrewing of the bomber actually cancels my extra bonus. So I get a plus one for being close, but the corkscrewing cancels that plus one. So coming in long range does give me three chances, but I lose some of my bonuses. So those are all part of the decision making you have to make. Um, when I have this starter plane with low firepower like this, I don't think I'm gonna be able to take a four engine bomber out in my first pass. So I like coming in long. And so uh, that's, that's a very long-winded explanation, but really the majority of the strategy and decision-making is here. Um, there's a lot of interesting choices to make, and there's a lot of different ways to go. And I think that as you level up your pilot, you get different skills you can adopt, and these skills can help you uh, take on the strategy of being one of those close-range bombers or a long-range bomber. I keep saying bomber, fighter. And uh, so that's something you want to keep in mind. And then your crew gets skills too, as well, and those skills will help you. Uh, like one of the big ones I'm thinking of is gunner, gunnery skill. You know, there's some things that you can do that can really help you to get massive damage uh, in, if you fire first and uh, etc. I won't uh, belabor too much. The rules go into what all the different skills do, but like I even have the ability to take one of these cards and say, oh, I don't like this card, I'm gonna replace it. That's if you become an expert, which is this skill here. So I can become an expert in my plane, and I can actually, like if this card said that he fires first, I can say nope, and then get rid of it and draw another card to, to increase my chances that I'm firing first every time. Okay, so uh, let's dive in. Um, my bomber has eight cannons, so uh, the rules state that you must fire all your cannons. You can't just say, okay, I'm gonna do the unlimited one and save my ammo, can't do that. And you always use one ammo when you fire. Um, there is this thing called extended burst. It's a rule option where I can fire using two ammo and then uh, I get a chance to do extra hits on the bomber. And again, that's a great strategy when you're coming in close and you only get one chance to take out the bomber. Uh, so you can do an extended burst, but you roll against the table and there's a chance that you could injure your pilot or even jam your gun. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that can be negative that can happen to you if you're doing extended burst. So be careful with that. Um, so I'm gonna just demonstrate doing a regular shot this time. So I'm gonna just spend one ammo and we have eight firepower. So that's what that means. So I come over to here and I see eight firepower and then the word GP. Okay, so <clears throat> you get out your chart here and first thing it shows you the B2, it explains what everything means. Uh, GP versus GP plus one uh, or even just a plain number like right there you see the number four. Okay, 
So if you see the number four, you would do random damage, which is done here. And before I even look at the chart, I missed one thing. I'm supposed to state what I'm attacking. So I, here's my choices. I can attack the port wing, the starboard wing, the airframe, or the gunner. Those are the four things I can aim for, and I'm gonna go for the starboard wing, okay? So with that being said, GP says it's group damage. I get to apply hits and roll for random. So what does that mean? Well, there's this is the group damage table, which is separate from the random table, okay? It's very important you get those two straight. I'm attacking the starboard wing, so I do this column right here. So I damage the controls. So I take a damage marker and I put it on the controls. I damage the engine times two, and then there's an in and out. So I have to just roll a die here. So that's an out, and then my other damage is also an out. So I do two damage to the outboard engine. So for starboard, that would be here. So I do two damage. And, um, so you have the in-engine in and then the out-engine. Um, then the starboard wing takes one damage. Remember, this is an error that's noted by the designer. So it's just times one. So the starboard wing takes one damage. And then it says I get to do one random damage. But remember, I'm shooting from long range. That's a minus one random damage. So that was canceled. So that's it. I did that damage to the bomber and I'm done. So now the bomber gets to damage me. And so you can see here that it says two hits. I get to subtract one because I'm attacking from long range. So he only does one hit. So I'm gonna move my chart. So what you do is you flip it to the other side and there's a B6 here, the night fighter damage chart. And I'm going to take two dice. This is gonna be my tens and this is gonna be my ones. It'll make sense as soon as I roll. So that's a 23. So I find 23 and my starboard engine took a damage. So I grab a damage token. I go to my plane and I can see the starboard engine took a damage, okay? Now when your engines are damaged, your speed drops by three. So I'm now at 12 speed and the Sterling is at 13 speed. So I can't keep up and the Sterling gets away. So I drop out of the mission. This is what I'm talking about, whereas if this was a 17 like the uh, BF-110, I would have still been in the match. So I failed to destroy this bomber. Um, <clears throat> now let's say I didn't get damaged. Everything here is theoretical. I'm just trying to show how this game plays out. Um, what would happen next is you would move to medium, and then you would just draw two more cards. I do get to change what I'm attacking, but let's say I'm gonna keep going after the starboard wing. So I'm gonna move these cards aside, and I draw two again. And this time, I ignore the text. I don't pay attention to the text. That is, that's gone. And I have eight firepower, so I'm going to do that extended burst I was telling you about. So I'm gonna spend two firepower two ammo off of there. So I still only have eight firepower, so I uh, I did four. Four random hits is what that means, okay? He's going to do two hits on me, but I chose to do what's called the extended burst, so I have to do an extended burst check. So bear with me, I need to find the chart for this. I know it's here, I just never Remember where it is. It's a small little chart. Oh, come on. My apologies. I know it exists seen it many times. Serious wound. Oh, right here, right here, right here. Extended burst chart. It's C3. 
Okay, so it says roll 2d6. So we're going to go ahead and roll 2d6. I rolled a 4. So the 4 says I get 3 more hits, but I'm blinded. Okay, so there is a blinded ability that I have to give to my pilot. I think it goes over here. Um, I would put it there. So the current unit is blinded, so that's his status. Um, I actually would have to look in the rules what blinded means, but I don't think it changes. Well, let's, let's test the rules real quick. So blinded is not here. Dang it. He's got everything in these rules, but he doesn't have blinded. Um, well, that's... That's a shame. Um, so I will have to look up what blinded means. So I will pause and get back to you. I'm back. I found it on page 9 here. Uh... It says, a blinded pilot may not conduct any attacks in the next combat round. And then, I may break off or wheel round to start a new pass. However, I get a minus one modifier. So, um, <clears throat> the way that would play out then is uh, this close target, I would not get to do any attacks. But uh, it would get to attack me. So, that's the drawback here. And then whenever I break off, I have to roll a die to see if I uh, lose the plane. I get a minus one to my roll, which means that there's a chance that the plane will escape. But in the meantime, I got plus three hits, which is good. Because with my eight firepower, I did four hits. So I get to do seven hits to the plane. Now, he's corkscrewing, so I get a minus one. So I'm only doing six hits to the plane. And... He does two hits to me, and this is simultaneous. There's no more. I know it says you fire first, but remember, you ignore that. So, um, I like to see what happens to me first. Remember, this is simultaneous, so it doesn't matter which order you do. So, I did a 25. Uh, so, my port engine is damaged, which is here. And then a 24. My oxygen. Ooh. Ooh. That's a new one. Okay, I think oxygen means I have to break away. And that is on this chart here. So you can see aircraft damage listing. So if it says oxygen, an aircraft that loses oxygen must break off after the current pass is complete and land immediately. So, um, I would be landing immediately anyways, so this is actually not bad. But if I were early on, I would miss all these other opportunities. So that's what that is, but I still get to do my hits, because remember, everything's simultaneous. So we flip this over, and we're going to do some bomber damage now. Uh, remember, it was 4 plus 3 is 7, minus 1 for the corkscrew. I get to do 6 random damage. I am attacking the wing, so I have to use the right side of the table, not the left. Okay, so I roll a d10 six times. So the first time is a nine. So the out engine is damaged. Unfortunately, the out engine's already damaged, so I can't damage it anymore. Second hit is a one, so I hit the wing. Third hit, another one. And I destroyed the plane, because you can see I got to the X. It is not a B-17, so this is the X. So the plane's destroyed. And so I would go into my log, and I would write down my plane on the log in that row, and then put a circle around it. Uh, let me do that right now, in fact. So I would show, sorry for my hands being in the way, Apologies. So I would write a sterling here and then circle it to show that I got the kill. And I would actually do kill, and this is my first sortie. 
Now, the reason you have to keep track of your sorties is if you do, let's say I do four sorties, then you actually get an experience point every four sorties. You don't get experience points based on number of kills. You can kill nobody. You can actually fight nobody. But as long as you do four sorties, you get an experience point. So experience points are based on number of sorties. Okay. Um, so with that said, we got our kill. We're blinded, so we're forced to land in this situation. Um, so you would just take your, your mat. You don't need this anymore. And so now we go back to this chart. We're on step six. So we have to roll to land the aircraft. It's a 2D6 on table B7. And so I'm, I got the table right here. So it's an eight. And so a two to a 10 is a safe landing, but you have some things here we have to deal with. Um, there is no FUB1. Uh, we don't have landing skill. We don't have a full moon. Our controls, have they been hit? No. Here's our hit damage. Okay. Um, do we have a serious wound? No, we don't. Uh, no damage landing gear. Do we have an engine that's out? No. Both of our, our engine is is damaged but it's not inoperative it would have been inoperative if we would have taken another damage here so that doesn't hurt us but we do have bad weather remember we had bad weather here so we had plus two so this eight becomes a ten and it's still a safe landing so there you go um, and then you can see you would have taken a light wound or potentially a very serious wound or even get killed based on how you roll and what happens here so uh, we would have landed safely. And then uh, in between sorties, you have to do, um, you know, progression and leveling up and things of that matter. Uh, so the rule book is the only place that really explains that. So I'm pulling that out. And you want to go to, I believe it's page 15. So the first thing you do is you get experience points. And remember I, how I said you get experience points for doing four sorties. We only did one, so we wouldn't get any. But we started the game with two experience points, so we could, and then what it does is it lists the skills. So for two experience points, for example, I could get navigation, and that little two there means it cost me two experience points, and I could negate the unsure of location penalty, which we didn't encounter on this sortie. Um, so there's a whole bunch of skills to choose from, and I think that's part of the big fun in this game is getting these different skills. Then you get to awards and prestige. So for example, if we were wounded, we actually get an award for that. Um, the one thing we do get is iron class cross second class is awarded for downing the first enemy aircraft. Now remember, officially speaking, we found nobody, but because I theoretically intercepted somebody, I would get the second class. And there's a spot for your Barbie here. So I put this on and boom, I'm probably wearing my medal. Now you get something else for that. Every time you get one of these, there are some exceptions and the rules will tell you when there are exceptions. I gained a prestige. So I am prestige level one. And then I'm gonna grab another one to show that I have one prestige point. Prestige points are something you can spend. So I could be at zero prestige points but still at prestige level one. So that's something, um, uh, your prestige level never goes down. It's always goes up, but the number of points you have, those get spent. So those are two different things. And um, I know somebody on BoardGameGeek mentioned component quality and somebody said that they were excellent. I just wanna point this out. That's just from punching. See that corner there? See how it's already peeling away? That's what I mean. These components, could be better, but they're no different than DVG's Hornet Leader, um, so I don't want anybody to panic. But that's the kind of stuff that some of the more expensive games have a little bit thicker cardboard that don't... You have to be really careful when you're punching your board. If you're very careful, you won't have this problem, and you can see that I wasn't very careful with that one. Okay, so that's my overview of this game. I am by no means a professional video person. I know some people got extremely upset
because I recorded this in vertical format the first time. Look, I did this because I wanted to help you to see what this game's about. And I hopefully accomplished that goal. I know nobody else has done any videos for this, and that's the reason. It's I'm on my kitchen table just throwing together something on my phone. So um, uh, I appreciate the feedback. Uh, I hope some people are maybe a little kinder next time. And um, I hope that you found this useful and helpful. And um, please let me know if I got anything wrong. I will put it in the comments and, and get it confirmed. And a big thank you to the designer for helping me so much with understanding the rules and correcting the things I was getting wrong the first time I did this. And uh, good luck. This is a very fun game. It's I know people are comparing it to Skies Above the Reich, and I'm going to just say this. They're very different games. This is about a single pilot. I think there's a lot of opportunity for a narrative here. There's a lot of... It's just flowing in historical accuracy. Um, this is about being the pilot and role-playing as you play. Um, Skies Above the Reich is about controlling an entire fleet. There's still some role-playing. There's still some... Uh, of everything. There's still narrative. Um, there's a lot more of like which direction do you approach and do you roll left, do you roll right. I mean you got a lot more choices the skies above the right and and that therefore means it's got a little layer of complication and that can appeal to some people. I'm not going to express one way or another. I think they're both good games and, and uh, that's why I've done videos for both and I hope uh, this helps you to make an informed decision. So thank you all very much, and uh, I appreciate it. Thanks for watching.